And we'll see how far we get this evening, but it's, it's again, we, we sort of were on a cliffhanger last week. It was all beginning to come down, and tonight uh, things are going to crash. So let's prepare our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we it would be much better to learn at the expense of the children of Israel and Judah that when you say something to us, we should pay attention. We pray your word would open tonight to every heart that's here, every heart that's listening, whether this evening on live stream or one day on the radio. But your ways are not our ways. It's amazing often, Lord, how simple it can be to be restored and to be right with you if we would just turn around, stop running from you, and confess our need to be forgiven. If we come to you through the blood of your Son by faith, we can be redeemed. We don't have to fight with God anymore, our conscience or the guilt and the shame of the things we've done. But we can surrender and find your peace. And so let your word open this evening to all of us who are here. And may we be changed as we consider you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to remind ourselves where we left off, chapter 38, verse 14, if you remember, Zedekiah the king had sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him in the third entry that's in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask you a thing. Hide nothing from me. And again, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians have surrounded the city and things are bad. Famine is getting worse. And so verse 15, then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I declare it unto you, Will you not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So chapter 38, verse 16, So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee, to de put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hands of these men that seek thy life. Notice he also didn't say, and I will listen. <laughs> anyway, it'll come to you in a minute. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Well, then thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will assuredly go forth, if you will surrender unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire. Thou shalt live and thine house. In other words, his sons, his daughters, etc. But if thou will not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, Well, then I'm afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, lest they, Nebuchadnezzar, deliver me into the Jews or their hand, and they mock me. I'm afraid of the people. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey I beseech thee the voice of the Lord. And that has been a repeated problem for the kings of Judah at this point, especially Zedekiah. They don't want to obey God. Which I speak unto thee, so shall it be well with thee, or unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house, his harem, shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, which again may not go so well for those ladies, and those women shall say, thy friends have set thee on. In other words, you're a wimp and you're influenced by your cabinet and those around you. You weren't really a ruler. And they prevailed against thee. And thy feet are sunk in the mire and they're turned away back. So they shall bring out the, thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans. And thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon. And thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. And Zedekiah said unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. And of course, verse 29, So Jeremiah, of course, abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. So chapter 39, we pick up. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, three years before everything falls apart, 
In the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. So they have come back. The Egyptians came their way. They pulled away for a little while, and then they returned. This is what we've been covering. But it started in the ninth year, and finally in the eleventh year, verse 2 of King Zedekiah. In the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And we learn later on, chapter 52, the famine had become severe. And when that happens, the fighting men lose their strength. The people's resolve begins to go down. They're not able to you know, post their watches on the wall. And so the city is breached, more or less. If you think of the city of David, sort of here's the temple. City of David, temple, kind of the middle area was breached, and they began to file in and to take over. So finally, in the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign, it all falls apart. So the walls of the city were broken up. Chapter 39, verse 3, And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. And Nagel Shodrezer and Shamgar, ne Samgar Nebo, and Sar Sarchim, and Rab Saris, and Negel Shalrezer, and Rab Mag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. These guys all come in. Now, interesting, as we go through here, Negel Shalrezer, we think, will be eventually known as King Negelisar, is the idea, the son-in-law to Nebuchadnezzar, so part of his entourage is there. Rab Saris, most feel that means he's Rab Saris, chief of the eunuchs. We've been meeting eunuchs as we go through this book, part of, again, the, 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 the traveling entourage of the king. And then, interestingly enough, Rab Mag, and you'll see that in verse 3, which most feel means chief of the magi or the wise men. Now, we just went through the celebration of Christmas, and what three people came to see the star and to see the king of the Jews? The wise men, you also know them as Magi. So here, this Rob Mag would be the chief of the Magi. It is interesting because when you read the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, he gets promoted for interpreting not only the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, but also recounting the dream, which he couldn't remember. And he would continue to climb up in places of authority within Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom to where some argue perhaps he might have been at one point the chief of those Magi. And so the, the question comes up, who is this individual? We're not sure at the time. But it may explain why. How many have ever read when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, refuse to fall down, chapter 3, to the big golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar has made? They get thrown into the fiery furnace. You know what happened. The Lord is among them. And the question that always comes up is, these three guys refuse to bow, but what about Daniel? Well, it could be that if Daniel had become Rab Mag and there was a military campaign going on, he might have been deployed in a campaign. Might explain that. Here as we get into the 11th year, we're now near 586. Daniel should be a man of influence. So I, I got to wait till I get to heaven. But it would be pretty interesting to find out if he was part of the entourage or at least was a close advisor to the one who was in this entourage. There's a lot of things we have to ask about in heaven. But here is this chief of the Magi, Rab Mag, part of this entourage, and they would seek to, you know, signs and wonders and astrology and other things. They'd try to foretell what's coming, and some would, you know, you know, the old animal entrail things. You've seen all the different ways that often they would do it through occult means and other things to try and discern, should we fight, should we not fight, will we win, should we attack? And so they would have along their so-called Rab Mag or spiritual advisors uh, to have influence also with the king. So he's got his whole group here. These guys all roll in through the middle gate and sit there and take over. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, king of Judah, saw them, it's over. They're setting up shop, basically inside his walls. And all the men of war that they fled, and they went forth of the city by night. They broke out, trying to run away, by way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out by the way of the plain, so probably heading out south of the city towards where the two valleys meet of Kid, Kid, uh, Kidron and Hinnom, and working their way down through there, they would basically be heading east, going down through the, the mountains to get down towards the Jordan River, down towards Jericho, and get out to those plains where the children of Israel would cross over under Joshua and come into the land. So they're making a break to get across the Jordan and try to flee, which, by the way, is the same sort of strategy that David employed when Absalom was coming for him. Get down to the Jordan and get across it and get some distance between you and your enemies. Slow them down. So they were headed towards the plain. But, verse 5, the Chaldeans who aren't starving pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho 
And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah, in this land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him, much like an unfaithful criminal, in a sense, or just an unfaithful vassal. And here's what happened. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zebekiah, or Zedekiah, sorry, in Riblah before his eyes. So there he forces him to watch as his sons are slaughtered in front of him. Again, we learned Jeremiah had prophesied his harem will be brought out. We don't know what happened to them in front of him. And of course, you'll know what happens in a few minutes, and then they will gouge out his eyes. Remember what we were told, and the reason we read chapter 38 again is because he was told, if you will surrender, you will live, the city will not be burned, you and your household will escape. Now he's refused to listen. He tried to run away. He's captured. And now we will find the city will be burned. His household is being slaughtered in front of his eyes. He's going to have his eyes gouged out. The last visual he's going to be able to remember for the years to come is the, the slaughtering of the family that he loved. And then he's going to be carried away to Babylon. And it's a, a simple but a painful reminder of when we deliberately disobey or rebel against the word of God, we can expect to face judgment. You can't make it any more simple than this. And so they slew the sons of Zedekiah and Riblah before his eyes. The king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah, so his, his rulers and those in his established government. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. The question comes up, God is love, right? Yes, that's what it says in the word. Well, then why does he send people to hell? Well, there's, uh, there's some discussion going on. Well, you know, they refuse to come or they would. You know, the, the Bible is very clear. God will convict you. The spirit of God convicts us of righteousness, sin, and judgment. If you will not listen to the conviction of the Spirit of God and you just, you know, I'm fine and I'll, be, I'll, I'll deal with the man upstairs when I see him, sure you will. And all those sort of colloquial terms you'll hear people say, you know, well, look, when you face the God of all the earth, he's going to review all that you've done that, have, that has offended his holiness and then he's going to punish you. He has to if he's holy. Now, he loves this creation so much that he desires they would repent, they would come to know him, they would be restored into his presence. So he sent his son to live a sinless life, to pay for our, our sins on the cross, to die and rise again, to prove the payment was accepted. That gospel has been you know, spread throughout the world, throughout the different centuries. You know, it is 2019 AD, year of our Lord. No matter how much the, the atheists and others try to change the calendar, you know, we have BC and AD for a reason, before Christ and year of our Lord. His very death, resurrection, and earthly ministry changed time and how we measure it. And so God has sent his son to pay for your sin. But if you won't accept his forgiveness, then when you stand before God, the books will be opened and God will confirm your rejection of him. Which means at the end of the day, you send yourself to hell. And God confirms your decision. A loving God has done everything possible to interrupt your life. You're here or you're listening, whether here on the radio or whatever. He's done everything he can to interrupt your life, but he will not force you to open your heart. Like this King Zedekiah, if you'll surrender, you'll be saved. If you refuse to surrender, you're going to destroy yourself. And that is something that carries forth to each of us before God. So... The Chaldeans, verse 8, did indeed burn the king's house, as Jeremiah warned, and the houses of the people with fire, and break down the walls of Jerusalem, which troubled Nehemiah. He'll come back to report, repair them. So then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away, so those who escaped and those who were still inside, that fell to him, and the rest of the people that remained... And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. So suddenly they become landowners. Now Nebuchadnezzar, gave, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan. Now, Nebuzaradan, it's an interesting name here because it says he is the captain of the guard. That word captain is head or chief, and guard can be executioner or cook. 
Well, if you're a cook and you're serving up meat, what did you have to do? There you go, you had to kill something. So some say you could actually take that title and you could be captain of the guard or captain of the executioners, or some would say literally the idea chief of the butchers. How'd you like to be handed over to him? Your city's going down the tubes. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah the prophet. Bonus question, who might have influenced Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to preserve a prophet of God in Jerusalem? Anybody? Daniel. Who do we know for sure read Jeremiah's prophecies? Daniel. It's quoted by him in chapter 9. So this may be some of Daniel's influence. Again, lots of questions for heaven. But Nebuchadnezzar gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuchadnezzar the captain of the guard, saying, find him, obviously find Jeremiah, take him, look well to him, do him no harm. But do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent, and Nebuchadnezzar, and Rabsaras, chief of the eunuchs, and Nebuchadnezzar, and Rabmag, chief of the Magi, whoever it was, and, and who I'm sure I'm willing to bet knew Daniel, and all the king of Babylon's princes, even they sent, and they took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison, and they committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Now, this had to be sobering. Jeremiah has been sitting there now. When he got out of the cistern and out of the mire and the muddy pit and finally was allowed back into the court of the prison, Zedekiah comes, has a couple private meetings with him, and he's just forced to wait. And he can hear outside the court, you know, the walls being breached and people screaming and all that's going on. But now they finally lead him out of that court of the prison and he's going to be a free man. And as he's walking through the streets of Jerusalem, he's seeing the dead in the streets. He's hearing the scream of women as their houses are being raided and they're being taken captive, children crying. He's walking through the smells, the sights, the sounds of all the things he's been warning about for almost 40 years. It's one of those times when you hate to be right. That must have been devastating to him. He had tried faithfully to warn these people that they needed to repent, they needed to get right with God, they needed to turn away from the idols, they needed again to honor the Sabbath as God's special people. He had tried over and over. They had beaten him. They had put him in stocks. They had imprisoned him in a pit with mud and mire. He had done his job faithfully, and yet, sadly, at the end of the day, he's looking around at all the destruction he had tried to warn them was coming. I personally think there must be no greater terror than to wake up realizing you have left this earth, you are now facing God, and you are sensing that you are under his wrath. There's in the New Testament, there's a word we go through, and I don't have it in mind right now, but the idea, it's, it's when one comes to the realization that their opportunity for salvation has now passed. You do not have another chance. How do we know that? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed once for a man to die, then comes the judgment. I can't think of a worse situation than when you realize that your days on this earth are finished. You are now standing before God. And you can see it. If you'd like to get a, an account of that, read Luke 16. How old do you have to be to drive? 16. What chapter of Luke? Luke 16. I do that so when you go home, you go, wait, what chapter was it? Oh, yeah, driving. Luke 16. Go read Lazarus and the rich man. He wakes up and realizes he's in torment and he's, he's horrified. And he's begging, Father Abraham, please, then send Lazarus back to my family, somebody. What a scary thing. So Jeremiah now being escorted out of the court of the prison to see with his own eyes what he's been hearing, the devastation that he had warned over and over again was coming and how he must have been so devastated to watch. So they committed him to get Eliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, we'll talk about him in a little bit, that he should carry him home, and so he dwelt among the people. He's been set free. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, well, he's still waiting to be set free, go and speak to ebed Melech, who was that? That was the Ethiopian eunuch who got him out of the miry pit, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good. And they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. You're going to see them. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword. But thy life shall be for a prey unto thee. Look at this. 
because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. Here he was faithful to watch out for Jeremiah. It was at potentially personal risk to himself. And now God's saying, all these men that were wicked to Jeremiah would not listen, etc., etc. They're going to pass. You were faithful to have fear of me and take care of my prophet. You are going to be delivered out. Notice, please, your life shall be a prey unto you because you have put your trust in me. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. The way you do that is you put your trust in him and you'll receive everlasting life. It's a decision you must make. So chapter 40. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go, which we just saw, from Ramah. And when he had taken him, being bound in chains among all that were carried away captive of Jerusalem and Judah, which were being carried away captive unto Babylon. So apparently they were in the court of the prison, chaining everybody up to each other in kind of a long trail. And it's from there that they said, no, turn him loose. He's ours. That he was set free, brought out of these things. And Jeremiah, the captain of, I'm sorry, and the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, listen to this. The Lord your God has pronounced evil upon this place. Now the Lord hath brought it and done according as he has said. Jeremiah was the one who was pronouncing it. Because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice, therefore this thing has come upon you. Again, what a slam when the enemies of God are more in tune with God's word than the people of God. Do you remember there that the, when Jesus has, he's been buried, he's in the tomb, the, the, the apostles are in the upper room, they're panicking. And do you remember when the Sanhedrin came to, to Pilate and they said, you know, we remember that that deceiver said that after the third day he would rise again, right? The apostles who heard him for three and a half years talk about this are in the upper room going, what do we do? What do we do? What do we? And meanwhile, the enemies are going, you know, he said something about rising again. Can we guard that tomb? They were listening more than the apostles, but they wouldn't receive them. That's interesting. So here's a, a Chaldean, a Babylonian saying, hey, your Lord, your God provide, you know, pronounced evil in this place, and he has brought it. That's why this has come upon you, because you've not obeyed the voice of the Lord. Sadly, they understood more of Jeremiah's message than the people in Judah. So this thing has happened as prophesied, verse 4. So now, behold, I loose thee this day from the chains which are upon thy hand. It sounds like he was literally set free of them. If it seem good unto thee to come with me unto Babylon, well, then come, and I will look well unto thee. And think of this. And if he had gone to Babylon, he would probably be hanging out with Daniel. Ezekiel is also there. That would have been interesting. Three prophets. Would it not? He could have been hanging out with Daniel. Do you think Daniel would have taken care of him? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I will look. So come with me to Babylon. We'll take good care of you. But if it seem ill unto thee to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before thee. Whether it seemeth good and convenient for thee to go, Thither go. So here's poor Jeremiah. He's been through 40 years of people basically just spitting at him. And now he's being set free. And this Babylonian ruler under Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, come with me. We'll set you up. Which way you want to go? He's just gotten unhooked from chains. He's going, ah, uh, paper or plastic. Ah, uh. he's just sitting there. How do I know? Verse 5. Now, while he was not yet gone back, he's, he's flipping coins. You know, Shekel's going, do I, do I, I don't know which way to go. What do I? I hadn't thought that far ahead. I was just hoping I'd survive. And here he is. Question. Did he go through adversity? Yes. Was he threatened? Yes. Did people hate his ministry? Yes. Was God faithful to him? Yes. Don't forget that. While he was not yet gone back, he's, he's not sure what to do. Nebuzaradan said unto him, 
Well, go back also to Gedaliah. He could tell he's not sure which way. Then just he gives him a suggestion. Why don't you go back to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. Now, Gedaliah's grandfather, Shaphan, was one of the people who had carried the scroll to Josiah. It was the secretary of Josiah's, was there when Josiah, hearing the scroll, ripped his garments, wept before the Lord, saying, oh my goodness, we're in trouble, and you know what happened, because your heart was tender towards me, and you wept, and wept at these things and tore your garments. Josiah, I will deal kindly with you. And of course, he would die fighting Pharaoh Necho and be brought home to his father, so to speak. And then you have Ahikam. Ahikam is interesting. He's the one back in chapter 26, around verse 24, who had tried to intervene to keep them from killing Jeremiah, one of those times they were upset with him. So it's a good line of people here to be from. These are God-fearing men. And now Gedaliah has been made the governor in the place of Zedekiah as a puppet ruler to the king of Babylon. So go back to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon hath made governor over the cities of Judah and dwell with him among the people. Or go wheresoever it seemeth convenient unto thee to go. So the captain of the guard gave him food. What have they just come out of? A famine. Gave him victuals, that's food to you and I, and a reward, and let him go. He's leaving, carrying a bag of food, a bag of gold or whatever it is, and he's free to go, walking past all those that he preached to who are bound in chains. Can you imagine? Can you imagine they're all like, There are some things I can't wrap my mind around. The idea that we're in the presence of God knowing there are people who are not. That's hard to understand here. And how we could be content to be in his presence knowing we're missing people that are not. That we know, I mean, it, well, how do you know we'll have our memory? Well, go back to Luke 16 again. Lazarus and the rich man, he's got complete mental faculties. He remembers family members and everything else. He's completely aware. So I don't understand how heaven's heaven when I know that there's going to be people that I, I know in this world that I don't think will be there, barring God's intervening or they're finally surrendering. And so what I can't understand here, I have to by faith trust that when I'm there, It'll be completely clear to me. Some of the hints that I get when I see in Revelation, which God willing, we will get to eventually in Sunday mornings. When we get into Revelation, you'll see that often the angelic realm around will say, true and righteous are your judgments, O God, for they slain your prophets and taken their blood, so now you've given them blood to drink. So basically heaven can say what God is bringing to the earth in judgment is right. And what God has allowed and even the way he's orchestrated things is right. But as we sit down here on earth in space and time and flesh and blood with a limited, you know, I don't know about you, but my workspace is about that big. I don't know how big your workspace is. There are things I can't fully understand now, but I've got to fall back to what I do know about God. I've got to trust that he's the judge of all the earth, that he is right. There is no darkness in him, no shadow of turning, that God is light, that he's holy. And so when I get there, what I don't understand now will be completely understood to me at that point. And when I understand and see the character of the judge reigning in his court, I think I honestly can say, like Job, I have no further questions. I abhor myself in sackcloth and ashes. But there are things I don't understand now that I know I'll understand there. And when I think of the idea of knowing that here we are and there are people who are not with us, that should be the little prick in our hearts to get into people's lives and say, do you know where you're going? Because I don't want to sit there with regret and having saying, I, I should have asked, I should have warned, I should have questioned, I should have tried to be a witness, you know. Especially as you look at Jeremiah, you know, well, gee, if I ask them, they might be offended. They might not sit with me at the lunch table at work anymore or whatever. This guy is walking out while they're all chained up. And Jeremiah can definitely say, I did not hold anything back. So just a couple of things to be reminded of here as we see this. He's set free to go. And people who refuse to hear, heed the word of God from him are now in bondage and are headed to destruction. So we let him go. Verse 6. So then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mitzpah, which is the Mitzpah, we think of the land of Benjamin, that area, about four miles northwest of Jerusalem, to Mitzpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. Now, 
when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, let me translate, when all the Jews who were outside of Jerusalem who had been hiding heard that it was all over. Everybody with me? Okay, so the people who had scattered and tried to hang out and not get caught, when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor in the land, and had committed unto him men and women and children, and of the poor of the land, and of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. Then they came to Gedaliah to Mitzpah, and we'll get a list here. Do you remember Jeremiah 24, the bad figs and the good figs? Remember that? Bad figs, good figs. Remember that? The good figs were the ones who went into captivity. Everybody remember. The bad figs were the ones who were going to remain there and go through the siege. So those who were deported and carried away were in Jeremiah 24 called the good figs. They were the remnant. Those who remained were the bad figs. And I'm giving you a little foreshadowing and hint for where this is going to go. Okay? You'll see it play out. So they came to get Eliah to Mitzpah, even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, and Jonathan, the sons of Kareah, and Sariah, the son of Tahuneth, Tahumeth, and the sons of Ephi, the, Nephtha, the Nephthathite, you try it, Netophite, Netto, you try it later. I'm going to meet some of these people in heaven and be like, dude, you, what, really? <laughs> Jezniah, the son of a Machathite, that was easier, and they and their men, and Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, swear unto them and to their men, saying, fear not to serve the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. That's a repeated message. Just, you'll be pardoned from your revolt. Just serve him. We'll be fine. They'll leave us alone. As for me, behold, I will dwell at Mitzbah to serve the Chaldeans. So again, he's basically a governor under their authority, which will come unto us. But ye gather ye wine and summer fruits and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. So whatever's left from the, the different cities, move in, take them, they're yours. And just live peaceably under the Chaldean or the Babylonian rule. This is late August, kind of beginning of fall time frame where these things would be harvested. And it's about the right time for this end of the siege. Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab, just across the Jordan Rift Valley to the east, and among the Ammonites and in Edom, so this is that mountain range there across the Jordan Rift Valley, heading down towards the Dead Sea. When all who were there in those countries, when they heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah, and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, news travels, even all those Jews returned out of the places whither they were driven. So all the people that ran for the hills, literally, that's where they went, the mountains of Moab are now coming back home once they've heard the battle's over, some form of government has been established, Gedaliah is the governor. They all came to the land of Judah, verse 12, to Gedaliah unto Mitzpah and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. Moreover, Jahanan, the son of Kerea, or Kerea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields, they came to Gedaliah to Mitzpah, again, Jews who had been part of this battle. And they said unto him, verse 14, Dost thou certainly know that Balas, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? Now I know what you're thinking. What does that mean? Well, let me explain. When the Babylonians took Jerusalem, they then began to also bring other territories in, into dominion under them. And they were fighting against Tyre, Tyre and Sidon, right? Tyre. Tyre has two locations. There's old Tyre that's on the mainland, and that's the one the Babylonians are fighting against, Tyre. And so they, they would destroy that city and rip it down to the ground. But the people of Tyre also had a fortress out in the water, just, uh, not, I don't know if it's quite half a mile, but they were in the actual water area. They were, they were merchants and seamen, and they would sail all around the Mediterranean. They were very wealthy. They did a lot of trade. They were good at shipbuilding. And so they had old Tyre and new Tyre. Old Tyre, the Babylonians took out. New Tyre will be taken out by Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great shows up, he says, hey, I want to come in and worship at the temple, the temple of Hercules. And these people are pretty shrewd. They said, no problem. You'll find it among the ruins on the mainland. Have at it. In other words, don't bother coming in. 
We don't want to deal with you. Alexander was so angry, he scraped all the dust of old Tyre destroyed by the Babylonians into the sea, built a causeway out, laid siege, and destroyed the other one. And that was prophesied before it happened, that they would scrape the dust into the sea. So you go read Zechariah 9, and elsewhere you'll find these things prophesied. So this is the first part of Tyre going down by the Babylonians. What does that have to do with our verse? Well, Balas, the king of the Ammonites, he figured if he could kind of cause problems in Judah again, wipe out the governor, wipe out some of the Babylonians left there to secure the land, that would slow the Chaldeans down from coming to Ammon and Edom and, and Moab and wiping them out. So in other words, like we're in running from a bear, trip the guy who's slower than you, right? So here's the idea. He's trying to stir up trouble to perhaps forestall an attack against Ammon. And so his plan that's being reported now to get to Gedaliah is, don't you know that Balas, the king of the Amorites, he has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to kill you. But Gedaliah, the son of Hikam, believed them not. So then Jonahan, the son of Kiriah, spoke to Gedaliah and Mitzbah secretly saying, let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. No man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? So in other words, knowing there's a threat against his rule, let's just preempt the attack. You thought that was new. You see, here's the problem. Gedaliah is an honorable man. And so he's basically dealing with people from that vantage point. No, they're not coming to kill me. No, that's just hype. No, I don't believe it. So Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said to Jonahan, the son of Kireah, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. Okay, church participation time. How many think the rumor is true? How many think the rumor is false? Well, we have time. Chapter 41. Now it came to pass... In the seventh month, so now we're September, October to you and I, that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishema, of the seed royal, so he is of the lineage of David's house. Okay, why would he be willing to take a governor down? What's in it for him? Succession. He's of the line of David's house. He takes out Gedaliah. He pronounced himself governor. So this could be essentially an attempt for the house of David to again establish authority. That would be a possible motive. We'll find out one day when we get to hear about it from the Lord in heaven. But he's of the seed royal. Interesting that's made known to us here. And the princes of the king. Even 10 men came with Ishmael. And they came to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mitzpah, and there they did eat bread together in Mitzpah. Psalm 23, thou preparest a what? A table before me in the presence of? My enemies, very good. In the Middle East, when you are invited to a meal, let me, well, let me back up. You're traveling through the desert. You come in the wintertime to black tents, two or three of them. And you come to the main tent, you can tell the sort of the most ornate. You have come to the tent of the sheik, the Bedouin sheik. He may have up to three or four wives or whatever he may have at that point. When you come there, when you arrive, you come in, you are now a guest. They will receive anyone who comes to them, even their enemies, if they come without aggression and ask to be a guest or ask for help. They will bring them in and they give you amazing hospitality. Several things. You do not show the bottom of your shoes to sheiks. You do not pass air this way or that way in the presence of them in the tent. That's considered absolutely disgusting. Uh, and you obviously behave yourself. And when they sit down, they get out this little wooden thing with a wooden stick, and they begin to go boop, 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 and they make their Bedouin coffee, which is, wow, strong. It's like, <laughs> and I don't drink coffee, so I'm like, <laughs> you know. And that little stick thing they're doing is letting all the other tents around them who are listening hearing boom, 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 to know that there are visitors. And when they know they're visitors, the other men from the other tents will come and they will sit and entertain. Now, if they give you a cup that has got just a little bit, like say half or three quarters of, of Bedouin coffee or tea in there, the idea is you're to drink it and then ask for more. And they'll let you stay so many days and there's different opinions about how many, but you're, you're well, they take care of everything you need. If they are attacked, while their enemy is under their roof, metaphorically speaking, they will fight to the death to defend their guests, even though it's an enemy. That is better than hospitality. When you come under that roof, you are a guest, they will do anything for you, 
And as you come in under the roof as a guest, you do not betray that hospitality. Everybody with me? Okay. Now, if you're there and they put a, give you a full cup of coffee, do you know what that means? That means when this cup is finished, you need to leave. So if you ever go to a tent out there in the Bedouin deserts, you know, and they get down, they boom, 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 and they hand you a full cup of coffee, know this, you're leaving. Just giving you Bedouin hospitality. So when David in the Psalm writes, thou preparest a table, to be invited to a table in the east is to be invited to fellowship and a blessing. Everybody get it? Now take it into the Psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You bless me in, in the face of or in front of my enemies. In other words, you bless me with your fellowship, with your favor, with your, your presence, so to speak, and you've sustained me, and you do this right in front of my enemies. You show the difference between the God that David walks with, the Lord is my shepherd, and the pagans who don't have his comfort in his presence. Psalm 23 is loaded with Middle Eastern terms and, and ideas behind it. And again, yea, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? How can a man who's committed adultery and murder possibly dwell in the house of the Lord? The answer is in the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. If you want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, you surrender to Christ. You ask him in your heart as your savior. You make the Lord your shepherd. He will not allow you to be plucked out of his hand. You will be with him in his father's house. Where we are going to sit at the marriage feast. He's going to prepare a table. We have been, and in the Middle Eastern terms, you have been invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others, Jeremiah, who've gone before us, who've been faithful to seek the Lord and to cling to him and abide. We have been invited to the ultimate place of fellowship and acceptance in God's presence. That's what he wants for us. That's what's ahead of us. It's going to be interesting. We're going to get to heaven, and in a sense, you could say, Hi, Dad, what's for dinner? So now, let's take this event here again. They came to get Eliah, the son of Mitzpah, and they ate bread together in Mitzpah. What is this? Hospitality. What do you not do during hospitality? You don't burp, you don't have flatulence. Yes, agreed. But what else do you not do? You don't behave as a rude guest. Have we got it? Let's see how his kindness is repaid. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with them at that dinner, and they smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him. This is the ultimate in treason, the ultimate in rebellion to your host. Wait a second. Last Supper. I tell you the truth. Remember what Jesus said? With great desire, I have desired to eat this supper, this meal with you. And then as he went along, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. To be the betrayer, behold, the hand of my betrayer is at hand at the table. To the, to the Jews around that table, that was the ultimate in treachery. You're invited to a meal and you're plotting to betray your, your Lord, your master, your host. And you know what happened. John rolled back on the Jesus' chest. They're laying on their left side. And he said, Lord, who is it? Why did he ask? Because Peter's around the other side of the table going. <laughs> right? They work together. Fishermen. Lord, who is it? It is he to whom I give the sop. The sop was a token of honor or appreciation that would be given to the, the head guest or the guest of honor at the meal. So Jesus reaches into the sop. That means Judas had to be perhaps the next person to him on the left to be able to put that into his mouth. Here he is betraying Jesus at that table and being given the token of honor. It says, and after he received the sop, Satan entered into him. From the Middle Eastern point of view, ultimate in treachery. And it was prophesied by David. Remember, he that has eaten bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. The psalm there, and that was of when David was betrayed by Ahithophel, who was the grandfather of Bathsheba. It all connects. Well, anyway, Ishmael rode up, rose up with his ten men that were with him. They smote Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword and killed him whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him. So this is a coup now, basically, even with Gedaliah at Mitzpah. And again, they, why did they let this happen? They're not thinking we're going to be attacked. They're at a meal together. That's where everybody calls off the dogs and just sits down. And so they, then they also attacked the Chaldeans that were found there. So whether it's a diplomatic entourage, 
and the men of war. So everybody who was in his presence are wiped out. Babylonian representatives, perhaps military representatives, and this is going to make them stink in whose eyes? Nebuchadnezzar, this is a problem. It came to pass in the second day after he had slain Gedaliah, no man knew it. He wiped everyone out. News did not get out of this compound. Well, it came to pass that there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men, 80, having their beard shaven, which is a sign of grief and mourning, their clothes rent, which is a sign again of grief and mourning, and having cut themselves, which is forbidden by the law. Leviticus 19.28, you're to make no marks, no cutting upon yourself. Why? Because God wanted his people to be different than the pagans. What's very popular now among youth? Cutting themselves. And yet we see cutting among the pagans. Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. They're under occult influence. What are they doing when Baal doesn't answer? They start cutting themselves. You know, people argue, well, pastor, I'm a believer. Yeah, I have a tattoo. Okay. Does that mean I'm, I'm out? God gave the law to the Jews, told them not to make marks on their bodies because he wanted them to be different than the pagans around them. And those marks and those tattoos and other things were they thought to give them occult power. So God wanted his people to be different. Okay, but whether or not you have a tattoo isn't going to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. It's whether or not you've received Christ in your heart as your savior. Now, I will tell you this. I've met many people wish they'd never gotten that tattoo. I meet more of them than people that are glad they have them. But it's interesting, the commentary of the Jews, the Jews felt to do markings and tattoos and everything else was in a sense to disgrace the work that God had done in creating you. It was, it was a sense trying to improve what God had given to you and not respecting his work that he had made for you to be fearfully and wonderfully made. But anyway, they're cutting themselves, which is part of the problem. The nations departed from the law, so they're doing something they ought not, but they're grieving and off we go. And they were coming with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord which, by the way, has also been destroyed at this point. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went from Mitzpah to meet them. So he goes out, weeping all along as he went. This guy's not stable. And it came to pass as he met them that he said unto them, while he's weeping, come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. What's the status of Gedaliah right now? He's dead. It was so that when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, slew them. And cast them into the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. But ten men were found among them, out of those eighty, that said unto Ishmael, Slay us not, for we have treasures in the field of wheat and of barley and of oil and of honey. So he forbear and slew them not among their brethren. What have they done? They purchased their lives back with giving them what, the, what things they had in the field. And this would be important as these guys are in a time of famine and all that. Now, verse 9, now the pit wherein Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah was the pit which Asa the king had made for fear of Basha, king of Israel. Is that clear? You're like, what was that all about? Asa was a good king. Ten years he reigned and things were quiet. And he built up very strongly militarily, got strong and all that. Things were good. He had some 500,000 or so soldiers under his command, and there came against him a million-man army out of Ethiopia. And Asa, realizing they're hopelessly outgunned, goes before the Lord and he says, Lord, it's nothing for you to deliver with many or with few, with weak or with strong, but they've come out against you. We're your people, so Lord, we're the children of Israel. You're our God. Don't let them beat you, Lord. Our eyes are on you. And the word came to Asa and those, you will, you know, the Lord will be with you. And God defeated the army and they had tremendous victory. And so many years went by where Asa was strong and increased his fortresses and all that. But then near the end of his reign, Israel, because it divided to 10 and 2, Israel began to make war against him. And so Asa took the gold and the silver out of the temple and he went to the Syrians and he paid for the Syrians to break their agreement with Israel, come down and attack Israel, so they would withdraw from Asa where they were beginning to set up to siege against them. And so he could then go take their fortresses and structures and all that and, and get them off his back. Militarily speaking, it was brilliant. He sent some money to break an alliance so that they would war against his neighbor, which would take the pressure off of him. And from a political military point of view, it was a good move. But the problem was he didn't go to the Lord. 
The first time when they were hopelessly overwhelmed, he had no recourse but to go to God. But when they had some money and they had some strength and they had some military capability, rather than go to God, he went to his own resources and reason and he didn't lean on the Lord and it became a snare to him. Very simple lesson. When we know we have no power, we cry out to God. When we think we can handle it, usually we mess it up. Can you relate to that? That was Asa. So this was a pit that he had made for part of that battle, that whole thing that he was dealing with, with Basher, the king of Israel. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, filled that pit with them that were slain. Interesting reminder, if not depending upon the Lord. So then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mitzpah. Even the king's daughters, those who were released, and all the people that remained in Mitzpah, who Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Amorites. So he's going to cross the Jordan and head over to what is today Jordan. But when Jonahan, who tried to warn Gedaliah about this, remember him? When Jonahan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, when they heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, then they took all the men that they had and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. And they found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. How many have heard of Saul, King Saul? How many have heard of Abner, son of Ner? Remember him. How many have heard of Isbosheth? Okay, good. How many have heard of Joab? And David. Okay. Once Saul died, Abner grabbed Isboseth, one of Saul's sons, proclaimed him king and tried to start a new king, a new kingdom under another son of Saul and the Benjamites. And there began to be this sort of war for a period of time between David, Joab, his commander, Abner, and Isboseth. So they came to Gibeah to this same pool of water as things were just getting heated. And they were sitting there, one on one side of the pool, the other on the other. And so Abner said to Joab, why don't we let the young men play before us? And I don't mean patty cake, patty cake. That's let's have a military conquest, your champions versus ours. So they put 12 versus 12. And these guys are all very skilled. They engaged, each one grabbed with the left hand, the guy that he was opposed to by the face with his beard. Scandinavians don't have that problem. But they grabbed him by the beard and they wrenched the head back. Once you wrench the head back, that exposes his whole side. And with the right hand, they took the knife and stuck it in and right into the heart or lung and, and took him out. Well, unfortunately, their skills were almost exactly equally matched. So each grabbed his opponent by the left hand on the chin and the beard. So both men are wrenched sideways like this and they both stabbed each other and all 24 fell down dead. Stalemate. Well, how would you feel if that happened to your 12 best guys? It erupted into a big battle. Asahel started chasing after Abner. Asahel, the brother to Joab, also the brother to Abishai. He was swift of foot. He wouldn't get off of Abner's trail. He kept So finally, Abner just went back, ran a spear right through him. He falls down. He's dead. And that began the whole bad blood between Joab and Abner to where finally Abner will be slain by Joab in the gate of a city of refuge, which was a big political problem for David. But you have to go back and read 2 Samuel because we don't have time for that. But it's the same pool that this happened many years before with Abner and Joab and the men of Israel. So they came to the pools at Gibeah, the great waters. Now it came to pass, and when all the people which were with Ishmael, captive, when they saw Jonahan, the son of Kareah, coming to rescue them, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, then they were glad. Yeah. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mitzpah cast about. They basically just uprose against, you know, did an uprising against Ishmael. And they returned, and they went unto Jonahan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Jonahan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. So he got away. So then took Jonahan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, from Mitzpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even the mighty men of war, and the women, and the children, and the eunuchs, they're always around, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed and they dwelt in the habitation of Chinham, not to be confused with Chim Chim from Speed Racer. Some of you were thinking that, so I'm trying to help you out. 
Chin him. We got a minute. David, when he fled from Absalom, remember that? Went across the Jordan. Finally, Absalom is killed by Joab. David is brought back over the Jordan, back to the land. And as he's coming back, he has an old man named Barzillai, who's 80-something. And he says to Barzillai, so when David was fleeing, Barzillai came out with food and, and a whole bunch of things to make them comfortable in their exile, basically. And so as David is returning, he said to Barzillai, you've shown me such great kindness. He was a man of means. He said, come with me to Jerusalem. I'll take good care of you and return the hospitality. And Barzillai said, look, can I taste what your people are cooking? Can I hear the voices of the maidens? Uh, the castle will be cold. I'll just be a burden to you. Let me stay here and die in the land of my fathers and be buried with my fathers. But I'll tell you what, take Chinham, my son, instead. So Chinham was brought into the court of David, put at David's table, and that's a place of honor, it's a place of blessing. And so Chinham was also there with David. And so now we find out that Chinham apparently was given some piece of ground, which is by Bethlehem, most likely from David, as gratitude to Barzillai taking care of him when he fled. So if that means nothing else to you, this is payback for kindness shown to David at one point when he was at a low point in his kingdom. So just pointing it out there for those who do the research, 2 Samuel 19, 37, you'll find it. This is Barzillai's son, Chin Ham. And so apparently he's got some habitation, some sort of plus place that he had given to him by David, which is by Bethlehem to go to enter into Egypt. So they went there. Why? Because of the Chaldeans. For they were afraid of them. What are the Babylonians going to do to us when they learned we slaughtered their governor? We've had an uprising in our own people. Now we're all fleeing. We killed their ambassadors, killed their military guys. They're going to kill us, right? We're going to be in trouble. What do we do? So they went there because they were afraid of them. Because of Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, who had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. Believe it or not, I thought we might even get all the way through chapter 43. It shows you what I know. So now they got a problem. There was a song in the 80s. Should we stay or should we go now? <laughs> if we stay, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> what do we do? So guess what they do? They see Jeremiah. Clearly you hear from God. You go to God, ask him what we should do, and we will do it. At least that's what they said. But we're out of time, so we'll figure out next week what they end up doing. Let's stand and let's pray. Lord, thank you so much this evening for your word. Lord, I, I appreciate the encouragement that if we're faithful to you, no matter what trouble may come our way in this land or in this life, you will deliver us through. I think of Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As they said, King, our Lord will deliver us, whether through the fire or from the fire, but we will not bow down to that image. And they were able to walk with you in the fiery furnace, and they were delivered through it. What a good reminder to us, Lord, if we're faithful to you, as we go through the letters to the seven churches over and over, you promise to keep us from trouble and deliver us through. So, Lord, help us not to be ashamed of the gospel, not to be ashamed of the lover of our souls, Jesus, who paid for us, but help us to be bold to be good witnesses in this generation because there is a day of judgment coming. And it may be sooner than we think. Help us to burn brightly for you with great hope and great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.